Welcome to Adastra. And yes, we are approaching the end of this story. But it's not the last one today, don't worry about that. We have some more story to go after this. So, let's just get into this. And uh, I actually had to change the page I saved these things on because there was a spoiler on the previous page. Yes. <laughs> let's get into this. We'll pick it up where we left things last time. Amicus laughs and leans in to kiss me again. My last full day on Adastra comes just as soon as I thought it would. Too soon. As I sit on the stone bench, breathing in the cool early morning air, I find myself trying to think back on the last few months, even the last few weeks. It's all a bit blurry. The days continued in the same way, me with too much time on my hands, while Amicus was kept busy by a rapidly changing empire. With this assigned role already in progress, I've mostly been left to wait, and while the wait seemed tortuously long, it simultaneously seemed unrealistically quick. It feels like only last week that I was touring the moon with Amicus, visiting the major cities on our way to pick up Cassius. It had been one of the better experiences I had on Adastra, really getting to see how different each part of the moon could be for the first time, despite the basically universal culture. I got to see the breathtaking mountain ranges that su surrounded the city of Lux. I rode giant, questionably safe amusement rides, and ate all kinds of good food in the city of Adrote, basically a giant Las Vegas. And all the while I got to stay in luxurious villas owned by the Imperial family, spending much of my time taking walks, fishing, and even hunting with Amicus. And then we picked up Cassius and Alex and the trip ended. That was over three months ago. Ever since then, the only thing I've really focused on is my studies. I've learned enough of the language that I can hold stilted conversations with Amicus. He always enthusiastically tells me that I'm doing an amazing job, even though I know I probably sound like a very young child to him. One with a heavy, clumsy accent. I don't think I've done enough. None of this is going to help me with my mission on Earth. Not since the experience I had with Amicus in the archives have I heard from the Monitor, let alone the parents. Instead, they seem to be content to just let me drift around aimlessly like I always have. It's gotten to the point that I even asked Amicus if what happened in the archives actually happened and wasn't all just a dream. And speaking of dreams, I haven't even been given one of those. Not even an All is Well from the Space Dragon. What's most infuriating is that Amicus is in contact with them. Of course, he's that on my behalf if they have anything to say to me, but nothing. I can only assume it's because they don't want to interfere with the process, even though they're going to have to tell me something. At least direct me where to go first. Otherwise, they're probably just going to hospitalise me when I show up talking about space wolves and the impending assimilation with the Galaxias. I feel my insides twist uncomfortably that I have been for the past several months, and especially in the past week. I'd had to leave Amicus's room because I didn't want to keep waking him up with my tossing and turning. That, and lying there awake, watching Amicus sleep innocently next to me, is just a bit too much for me right now. I know I should be savouring these last moments, but instead, I find myself twisted up in worry. I'm going to be alone. It's something that hasn't really scared me much before I came here, but after being with Amicus for so long, and now with this path ahead of me, I go from hugging myself to twirling the now-fitted ring on my finger. It's been a security blanket of sorts. We had debated on whether or not to marry before I leave, but eventually decided Amica should lay some legal groundwork first so as not to cause too much of an uproar. He has eight years to do it, after all. It'll give me something to look forward to when I return. Our entire lives are just to fit the schedule laid out by the parents. This is all assuming they're telling the truth, and not for the first time. I wonder if I can really count on them to make sure I return to Adastra. They're controlling everything, and I don't think they would be sending me on a mission that would somehow result in me never coming back here. That's the whole point. I'm uniting two different worlds. I sigh, closing my eyes at the ridiculous weight of that statement. Why the hell did they choose me? I'm a fucking idiot. 
I open my eyes again as I hear shuffling steps up the path. For a moment I think it's going to be Amicus, maybe having woken up and found me missing from the bed. It's what I hope to see, even though I know he needs his sleep. I'm under enough stress right now that I'm willing to be selfish. But no. I'm a bit surprised to see Virginia walk along the main path. Head down, she manipulates one of those transparent tablets that the officials around you have. She gets closer. I let out a soft cough so I don't surprise her. She looks up, her pace slow before she realises that it's me. I'd assume she would just continue on her way, but now she deliberately walks in my direction. Pleasant early morning to you, Tibor. Good morning. I must say I'm a bit surprised to see you outside before Vita has even risen. I shrug. I had trouble sleeping. There's a pause and Virginia gives me a look, one that I think is sympathetic. I imagine. More silence. Even now, at the very end of my journey on Adastra, I feel the stiff, awkward wall between us. Out of everyone I've met in the palace, I feel I know Virginia the least, and that includes Alex. While her intentions became clear to me, like everyone's eventually did, I literally know nothing else about her. I try to fill the silence. So what has you up so early? Virginia raises an eyebrow. We've run out of time to negotiate funding for a few smaller provinces to the north. I'm using the early hours to make time. Well, that doesn't sound fun. It is not meant to be fun. My life is now dedicated to serving the Empire. My own concerns do not matter. I sigh. Listen, I'm going to be honest here. You seem less happy than you were before you had this position. Again, my concerns are not important. I'm not saying they are. I'm just wondering why you wanted this position if it's only making your life worse. Virginia gives me a long, hard look. It always seems like our conversations become tense if we talk for more than three sentences. I think that you are not understanding the concept. My concerns do not matter. I do not matter. What does matter is the work I do. So, you just wanted to run the Empire in a more efficient way, or something? Yes, or something. You could just be blunt like the Chemians are and tell me. We get to the point and you wouldn't have to be so angry all the time. The look on Virginia's face has me raising my hands defensively. All right, sorry. I know whenever I talk I just piss you off, so I'll just stop. What has you so brash this morning? Everything. I put out my hands to either side of myself as if to indicate the whole situation I'm in. But at least I'm not always... I don't know, acting like you're just an annoying distraction... Hell, even Cassius acknowledges my presence more than you do. I mean, it's a bit late now, but considering I'm in a relationship with your brother, maybe we should get to know each other when I come back. Virginia regards me for a moment and takes a deep breath. Tibor, I know you're leaving tomorrow, as we all do, but I also know that you will be back and I'll be made to work with you for a very long time, likely the rest of our lives. I frown. How would Virginia know I'll be working with the Empire? Is she supposed to know that? I start to wonder if the parents are talking, just not to me. Virginia answers that question next, though. Amicus told me, as he should have, considering my position. It will help us prepare, at least in secret. I wonder if the parents told him that was okay. I don't want to deviate from the plan at all if it risks my mission. Virginia interrupts my thoughts, though. But I will say this once and never again, so remember it when you return. I wait expectantly. While young, my brothers and I experienced very different sides of my father. He coddled Amicus, neglected Cassius, and for me it was a sort of in-between. He paid me very close but strict attention. Unlike my brothers who received lessons in maths, science and combat, I was given lessons in speech, etiquette, but mainly I was subjected to long, cruel sessions of behavioural moulding. He altered who I was as a person, something he would never do to his sons. Oh, why? All I understood at the time was he planned for me to occupy a prestigious position in the Empire. Still, I hated him for it. I felt almost no emotion when his sabotage ship crashed. No. Oh. Yes, odd how he project himself the most egalitarian emperor in our history, yet treat his own daughter like clay that he could shape in any way he wanted. No, I'm really at a loss for words. But, following his death and the resulting power struggle, I came to learn why, when the reason was rather simple. 
If I were to be the first female in a particular position of power, I needed to set an example. Not only that, but I would need to ward off attempts by those in power to undermine me. My mind was already trained for the deceit I would come up against, and it serves me well, even now as officials spread rumours and attempt to discredit me. Amateurish rumours, I'll have you know. Seems they can't think of anything more complex than saying the reason I get so much done is because I'm a whore. But Father personally made sure I understood the most important lesson in this empire. Trust no male. It's what will keep me alive in this role. While I still hate Father, I understand him now, which is better than just hate. Through all of this, I can only sit there awkwardly on the bench. Okay, so is that why you treat me the way you do? I'm a male and you can't trust me. Tibor, I trust no one. I simply don't have to worry about women because they hold no power. Yet. I tell you this so you might understand me as you wished. We'll need to be close allies in the future, after all. While I'm sure my upbringing has a little bit to do with my demeanour, the main reason for my shortness with you is simply due to your immaturity and lack of self-control. Amicus is no different. A grimace. I think I'm a little bit better than Amicus. Mm, yes, though he is growing to his position well enough, I'm sure you will as well. I'm not sure if that's encouragement or an insult. And thank you for saving my brother. I don't believe I've had the chance to say that yet. I know what I just said, but he's one of the few I can trust to uh, be himself. Then Virginia turns away, walking towards the Imperial ship. I really must be off to the city now. I'll be present for your departure tomorrow morning. Goodbye. Bye. I watch Virginia walk off into the dark, still feeling like I don't really know anything about her, even if she did kind of open up to me for the first time. At least she's willing to work with me on how to integrate humanity. I'd been worried about that. The edge of the sky is just turning a lighter blue as I make my way back into the palace. This is usually about the time that Amicus wakes up, so I'm not surprised to hear the shower running when I walk into his room. I think about going into the bathroom and then think better of it, not wanting to hold up Amicus's morning routine. I have to admit I'm a little disappointed that he didn't come looking for me first thing. Usually that's something he'd do if he's not sure where I am. For now, I just sit on the bed and wait, gradually growing more tired as the minutes go by, finally feeling like I might be able to get some sleep. Then the door slides open and Amicus steps out, freshly showered and dressed. He smiles brightly when he sees me. Well, there you are. I was wondering if maybe you'd gone to get breakfast early. Immediately I'm jarred by Amicus's overly cheerful demeanour, his voice louder than usual. No, I just needed some air. Eh, is it too stuffy in here? No, it's freezing, as usual. I stand up and hug Amicus, which he enthusiastically accepts. I sink into his furry warmth, and I feel my eyes sting as the reality of how much time we have left really sinks in. Amicus. My voice is small and sad, and Amicus quickly but gently sets his paws on my shoulders to push me back a step so that he can look me in the eyes. Hey, I'm going to be back early tonight, as early as possible. Unfortunately, there are a few mandatory meetings involving the Chemians that I must attend. I know. Amicus already tried to take the day off, but of course things came up. Oh, don't worry. I've kept a night simple. Just dinner between you and I. I can tell that Amicus is putting on the brave face. So I do the same and swallow back the awful feelings that have been threatening to overwhelm me. All right, I'll be waiting. Oh, good. I won't be long, and the sooner I leave, the sooner I will return. Then you better get going. Oh, right away, Emperor Consort. I grimace at the title I would hold if Amicus made our marriage official. But he plans to kiss on my face anyway before pulling back and smiling at me. I love you, and tonight we should be happy. I try to smile back as Amicus takes his leave, disappearing out the door, wondering how I'm going to manage to do that. Hopefully well enough for Amicus' sake. I'm able to nap for a few hours, after which I walk through the halls, though at a much slower pace than usual. I take a good look at everything, remembering. I walk past the meditation room and I pause before opening the door. I'd made up with Amicus here after our fight a year ago. This also where I accidentally got high on the Somni Cassius had been smoking. The main reason I opened the door, though, is because I'm curious if any of that plant is lying around, maybe try to contact the monitor myself. 
I don't see any, and remembering Cassius's horrible experience gets me to give up pretty fast, not wanting to be tormented by the monitors I didn't follow their plan correctly. I head out into the gardens like usual, taking in the beauty of the arranged foliage for the last time. I remember my first morning here, with Alex. He'd been so helpful and kind, and I feel some sadness the idea that I'll probably never see him again. It's still the bits I also remember that he'd also been, only been sizing me up for manipulation even then. While I feel our friendship had been partially genuine, I know that what he's done is something I can never forgive, even though Cassius was able to. I head back in for a light breakfast, sitting on Amicus's usual bed. I watch the screens as I do, not surprised to see Amicus's face pop up a few times. He is the Emperor, after all, but I am surprised to see my own face, and I know immediately they're talking about us, speculating. I tell Com to turn it off and sit there for a bit, thinking back on what had happened in this room. As always, my eyes are drawn to the dark wine stain in Cassius's bed, something that remains even after a deep cleaning. It hasn't been replaced, likely because Cassius doesn't really live in the palace anymore. Of course, it always brings to mind the moment he drank that poisoned wine. The day we'd all sat there, knowing something was wrong, yet Cassius still trusting Cato enough to never suspect an assassination attempt. Something he would have suspected if Nefario and I had been less cautious about releasing the information on the sabotage ship. It probably wasn't enough to convict him in a trial, but all would have known. Even though I'm not sure why I'd handed the wine to him, knowing it would end badly, knowing I should spill it just like I did my first time serving. Yet I did what I was told, almost like a robot. Maybe because I'd been conditioned to do whatever the wolves told me. I don't blame Cassius for staying away from the palace after what he went through. An assassination attempt resulting in a week-long coma, followed by hospitalisation for a month, does things to the mind, according to him. I wonder if that includes forgiving a spy that's partially responsible for dozens of deaths. Feeling slightly nauseous, I send the rest of my food back. I decide not to think about Alex anymore, feeling that the cat had never gotten what he deserved. I need to distract myself until Amicus gets back, so I head for the baths. It's become part of my routine and the part I always look forward to the most for a couple of reasons. First, it's just nice to soak, and second, because I see the person I often run into here. He soaks in the pool, head leaning back against the edge, eyes closed. While I may have lost my friendship with Alex, I gained a great one with Neferu. Good thing too, considering he's the only other sapien that's regularly in the palace during the day. I walk over the benches, beginning to strip off my robe, glancing at the jackal. You know, it's not safe to fall asleep in the bath. The pharaoh shifts, raising the eyebrow even though he keeps his eyes closed. I appreciate your concern, but I feel that the sensation of water filling my lungs will be sufficient to wake me up. And I was not asleep, I was awaiting your arrival. I walk up to the edge of the pool, the pharaoh turning his head to look back at me, not even glancing at my naked groin. Really? I didn't think you'd be here. Amicus told me he had Chemian meetings to go to. Briefly, I feel a little upset at the idea that Neferu might stay at the palace to see me while Amicus wouldn't. But only briefly. Things are different for the Emperor. Oh, luckily for me, my presence is no longer requested at such meetings. Oh, it matters little. I have direct access to the Emperor anyway. I sigh. You should choose your words carefully in front of the Emperor's fiancé. Why must you think I always speak in innuendos? Because you do. I jump into the pool. It's not something I usually do, and I'm reminded why as my entire being burns for a few moments. It's worth it, though, as I come up and see that I've accomplished my goal of spl splashing the pharaoh, the jackal in the middle of pouring water from his eyes. I must say, you become more like him every day. I move to the bench to sit beside the jackal, my own eyes stinging from the salty spring water. Is I'm more willing to shut you up? Yes, crude like the wolves haven't resort to physical methods because they can't use their words properly. I narrow my eyes. Well, talk enough shit then you're going to get hit. Humans are the same and I have a feeling jackals are too. How would you know? I've never raced a paw against anyone on this moon. Probably because you know you wouldn't stand the chance. Also, I've seen you fight, first with Alex, and remember you accepted the spa with Amicus a few months back. I seem to have forgotten. Well, I haven't. You took off all your clothes to tease him, then got floored in like a second. 
He struck me in the stomach when I was not ready, and very hard, mind you. My combat techniques are as crude as their words. You weren't ready, you were still using your words after the fight had started. Even though the incident has been a little worrying at the time, I find it mostly funny now, and I smirk at the memory. How oh, is that funny? I had to check into hospital to make sure it didn't rupture anything. It was very dangerous to do such a thing in what was supposed to be a friendly spa. I think it was the way you went from showboating to make the weirdest noises after you fell on the ground. Amicus probably did take out a lot of his built-up frustration in that attack. Unfortunately, it resulted in even more tension between the two of them, which makes things difficult because I like them both. I guess the pharaoh at least still talks official business with Amicus. The pharaoh huffs. I like that blow, bringing that up is rather low of you. He's right. My mood is a bit strange today, and just like with Virginia, I find myself being more blunt. I shrug. Well, so is making shitty comments about all wolves. The pharaoh sighs loudly, seemingly at a loss for words. A rare sight. I start to feel a bit guilty and clear my throat, changing the subject to the subject I'm not really sure how to explain to the jackal. So, uh, I'm leaving tomorrow. The pharaoh's eyes light up. So I have heard, which is why I wanted to be sure that I would see you today. I'm starting to regret it considering your mood. I slump against the ledge. Sorry, I'm feeling weird today. I'm just overwhelmed with everything that's happening. Well, you'll be returning, won't you? Yeah, just not sure when that might be. Obviously, Amicus wouldn't have told Nefero about our situation. Maybe even the parents directed him to. I'm guessing it was Virginia who told him I'm leaving. This is a temporary trip, is it not? You are engaged to be married, after all. I shifted to Lendra's intense gaze. Yeah, I miss my planet. I just need to be home for a while. So it might be a while. The pharaoh is quiet for a moment. Does a while mean weeks? Months? I look away over the surface of the steaming water. Maybe a bit longer. Years? It's more of a statement than a question. Maybe. Well, I must say I was rather shocked to hear of your sudden plans for departure, that you would not tell me earlier. I half-heartedly will the parents to send me a signal I can just tell Nefero everything. But, like always, all is quiet in space. But now I'm less surprised, considering that it sounds like you yourself did not realise you would be leaving. I just didn't know how to tell you. Mm, That, or you're hiding something. I look at him. What? Oh, Tibor, you're not nearly as subtle as you think. Like I said, you're becoming more like Amicus every day. What do you mean? Well, your sudden interest in galactic affairs, for one, but mostly it's more your mere presence here in the first place. It makes little sense. Oh, yeah? I kind of hope that the pharaoh figures it out on his own, considering that would dodge the issue of me telling anyone. Oh, yes. If I were to guess, you're currently being trained by Adastra to assimilate your people with the children of the wolves. I physically recoil at the idea, even though he's incredibly close. What? Hell no. I never do that to my people, or to any people. Despite Amicus being emperor, and despite his slow but steady improvements to the wolven children, it's still not a situation I'd put Earth in willingly. The pharaoh raises his eyebrow again, seemingly convinced by my reaction. Hmm. We regard each other a moment, and the pharaoh blinks first. So you really won't tell me? I didn't say I have a secret to tell, though. You're just assuming. Honestly, I'm a bit hurt that you feel you can't trust me with this information. After all this time. Now I raise an eyebrow. The Pharaoh, you haven't told me anything about your own situation on your planet, along with your family. Well, you've never asked. Because I know it's personal. You dodged the topic whenever I brought it up. It's a very long story, first of all. And second of all, it's a story about me being a selfish, foolish brat. Of course I wouldn't want to tell you. But if I tell you, would you tell me? I think, somewhat tempted to make him tell his story than just lie about mine. But only for a second. I sigh. No, I, I'll i only be able to when I come back. The pharaoh's impish nature deflates pretty quick. Well, at least you're honest. I suppose I'll trust you that it's rather important it's not my place to know. I admit that I am still hurt by all this, and that's not something I admit often. Sorry, I promise, you'll understand once I'm back. Again, I wonder if I'm already admitting too much. But years? I can't predict where I'll be in that amount of time. Back on Chemia? 
possibly if all goes well. I'll visit. I'm a citizen, remember? Well, they rarely allow use of the stretch for only visits, but being the Emperor's husband might make that easier. Yeah, I'll convince him. That seems to bring the issue of my sudden departure to a close. We sit there in silence for a long while, then I place a hand on the pharaoh's knee. It's not something I would have done in the past, considering the jackal's reputation, but nothing about it feels sensual. Instead, I do out of pure solidarity and friendship. And I wanted to say thank you, Neferu, for everything. Well, I don't think I'd be alive if you weren't there for me. I know you had your reasons. Everyone did. But thank you. It is the duty of all Kimu to protect any sapient fleeing wolf and violence, whether they be sibling child or, as you happen to be, abandoned. I'll believe that after I visit Kimu and have a look for myself. I'll be your tour guide. And the Pharaoh, you can still tell me what's going on with your family, if you want. Oh, definitely not. Do you really want to know? The situation is complex and unresolved and seems to always be changing. I mean, yeah, I'd like to know. It seems really important to you, but... Feels unfair that I make him tell, his tell me his clearly painful story without my own. Again, when I'm back, then we can trade. Deal. The Pharaoh stands up, pull it, stepping up onto the bench before reaching down to pull me up. Now let's go for a walk before your wolf returns. I'd like our last conversations to be of happier things. I take his paw, letting him pull me up. Then the two of us step out of the pool to towel off and dress. The pharaoh is easily able to shift the conversation to things that are light and interesting. It always makes me forget that I'm leaving. And so this Wolverine actually believes the Imperial family would even consider apologising for the war. Well, absolutely asinine, if you ask me. Sounds reasonable. What? No, Tibor is not. We suffer the heaviest casualties. But wasn't it started by the Empire? No, it was started by Chemian provocation. Haven't you learned the history? Well, yeah. But attacking a planet full of sapient children wasn't the best way to respond. We attacked Achaemian bases with weaponry which happened to be on the planet full of children. They were never fired on directly. So says the Adastrian history books. Ugh, why do you assume that? It's not a good argument to just whip out assumptions that these are lies. My father never lied. I'm basing off what I've learned from Achaemian history as well. I'm not only learning about Adastra, you know. Amicus is quiet, but still looking huffy, so I lean over on my side of the couch to touch his shoulder. Listen... I'm not saying your father is a liar. I'm saying that sapiens as a whole are. I know because humans do the exact same thing when we write our history. You should have a bit more pride in your species. How will you lead the humans otherwise? And actually, I think pride is the biggest woven problem. Amicus just goes quiet. I think I hit a sore spot talking about his dad. Although I'm enjoying our usual somewhat intense banter, I don't have as much energy as usual. Sorry, I shouldn't talk about things I don't understand. Amicus looks at me with surprise. What? No, I do want you to talk to me about these things. I might seem upset, but I've already told you I enjoy debating. I wave away Amicus's rush to smooth things over. No, me too. I'm just a little tired today. Ah. What I want to talk about is what's about to happen to me, about how I'm starting to lose my courage at the last minute, how I don't want to do anything except stay on this couch. But I can tell Amicus doesn't. He came in with the stories of the day right away, as if this isn't our last night together. Why well, it have been easy to pretend when the pharaoh, it's much more difficult to see Namicus put on such an act too. I assume make me feel better. Amicus, I don't know if I can... Amicus suddenly holds up a paw. Wait, Tibor, I... I know, but please, let's have this night together. I promise you, the situation will become clearer for you. Just give it a little more time. That gives me pause. It's like Amicus knows something that I don't. And trust me, because we're travelling back to Earth together, we'll have plenty of time to discuss whatever you wish. Amicus's eyes start to glisten just slightly as he holds back tears, then clears his throat. But for now, I think it's preposterous that they expect me to apologise. I watch Amicus for a long time, realising that he might be right. He's in constant contact with the parents, and I respected the fact that he can't tell me what they say unless given specific permission to do so. And though the feeling is unnerving, there's also some comfort in the idea that maybe something will help me at the last minute, and Amicus seems to know that. 
On top of that, he knows how hard this is going to be. We both do. But he wants to save the tears for the end. So do I. So... Well, if it's just the Imperial family apologising, that's actually asking for very little to create an alliance. Well, it's one of many demands, and they simply want to humiliate us, all because the Pharaoh managed to get his balls kicked in. I mean, the Pharaoh's son. You should all honestly consider yourself lucky no one else saw you hit him. Huh, <laughs> he's an easy one to hit. What's he expect always leaving himself wide open? He deserved it, both times. I sigh. Be nice, Amicus. I lean into him and he finally pulls me into his lap, nuzzling my hair. We talk for a while longer, the two of us trying to stay awake as long as possible. I finally manage to relax a bit and finally my eyes grow heavy now because his warm breath puffs steadily against my head. I imagine this moment folding into a pocket of infinity, made to go on forever, our responsibilities gone, the coming trials never to arrive. But time does march on, because without realising it, I start to fall asleep. You're on the right path. I grasp blindly at the sound of his voice. Help me. I don't know what to do. My feet slide quietly across the rug and marble, leaving Amicus behind on the sofa. Apologies for the extended silence. But why? I don't know what I'm doing. But you do. I walk deliberately in the direction I know to go, my own distraction being the furious twitching in my left eyelid. You needed time to learn about yourself, to learn about the Galaxius, to steal your resolve, and now you are ready to forge ahead. But I'm not. Then... Would you like to glance through the eyes of the parents to see what lies ahead? Yes. How do I even begin? Instructions for the first steps in your assignment will be given upon your arrival back on Earth. But... What we want to show you is instead what is possible, what is guaranteed if you follow all of our instructions. He senses my confusion. Instead of telling you, we can show you. My left eyelid flutters, everything starts to fade. Eight years pass by in a cosmic microsecond. You return to Adastra a changed man. You find Amicus changed as well. What does not change are the feelings between you. The thread connecting you to your wolf never breaks, never wavers. A constant reminder of where you belong. And when you see him again, you will know this. You will spend the rest of your life with Amicus. A long life. You worry that what it is ahead is too difficult. Instead, the worst is far, far behind you and will only grow more distant with the slow passage of time. You marry Amicus. You travel the Galaxias with him, always by his side, never to be separated again as you continue your work. You see creatures and civilizations that no human before you could have ever dreamed of. You experience much. Some of it is difficult and painful, but most of it is beautiful. You carry these experiences with you for the rest of your life. You see Nefero again. You work with him and he will become your closest ally. And then you return to Adastra 40 years later, your work complete. But much more time is ahead of you. You make full use of it. You and your wolf change Adastra for the better. Power will shift from the Imperial family as Amicus reforms the fabric of Adastran politics. You and your wolf will have more time with each other, and within 100 years, the Imperial family will formally relinquish its hold on the moon. You spend most of your time with Amicus, and some of your time alone. But all of it is time well spent. He takes you to the lake. He takes you to the city. And 200 years after you first met Amicus, you both retire to a villa on the countryside. You grow all together. The last 50 years of your life, you create even more experiences with him, somehow just as exciting as the ones in your youth. 
you defy all expectations, live nearly three hundred years. And when the inevitable happens, you slip through to the next plane easily, ending this life in his arms. Smell of lavender, the last sense you experience. And then, only a few decades later, your wolf joins you in the amalgamation. You will mingle there for eternity, reliving the best moments of your life with your wolf forever. I come too slowly on the floor under the archives. My vision is blurry and I reach up to wipe away tears. Even now I feel the incredible warmth and happiness that seem to overflow from my chest as I live that. What was that? My future? I'm not sure what to think right now. For the first time in months I feel completely at peace. This is my future. I need this future. The sights and feelings were so vivid, so beautiful. I need that life with Amicus. I know it feels as if the parents are stringing me along with the promise of a reward. I also felt the feelings of my future self. I truly believed in what I was doing, or I guess will believe. I had mixed and melded with so many different times, I'm a little confused at what time I'm in now. It takes a moment to become used to seeing time like a human again instead of a parent. But when I adjust, my heart leaps in my chest at the thought of so much time ahead. The eight years are nothing. I lie there for a while longer, catching my breath, and just stare at the starry sky through the opening in the ceiling. Silently, I thank the parents who have finally shown me what the point of everything is. With a shaky sigh, I get to my feet, wanting to get back to Amicus's room, wanting to tell him everything, but knowing I can't. I wonder if they let him see it as well. I hope so. I take a deep breath, feeling the cool, fragrant night air against my wet face. I stand there a moment, just happy to be alive. I'm so lost in this euphoria I barely notice footsteps up the hall. Then voices. Laughing and talking. I just stand in the doorway recognising those voices. Oh, Cassius, stop. We need to be quiet. Alex's voice is a hushed whisper, though I can tell he's trying not to laugh. Oh, and not your tail, kitten. What will they do? Arrest me? Something's odd about Cassius's voice. It's slurred and tired sounding. I even attempt to hide as the two of them stumble into view, Alex clinging to Cassius's neck as the wolf tries to keep his balance. Alex giggles while Cassius playfully nips him around his face and neck. Oh, stop, you're going to make me laugh. So are we here. Alex spots me and pulls away from Cassius, standing stiffly to the side. Cassius, not having seen me yet, tries grabbing at him and gets his paws slapped. Ouch, not so rough, my joints ache. He stares at Alex, he, Alex even as the cat tries to nod in my direction to tip the wolf off. It takes a minute, but eventually the white wolf gets it. Ah, oh, sir? He looks at me, takes a moment to process it, and stiffens up as well. Oh, ape creature! I frown, wondering if he's forgotten my name already. My focus is mainly on Alex. Hey, Alex. I'm still feeling high and confident for my time trip. Um, Hello. This is good. I actually wanted to talk to you before I leave. Here we go. <laughs> that was uh, a little tough for me at the end. That's not going into details, but that was probably the hardest video I've actually done. Hopefully you don't notice the edits. <laughs> but yeah, there's one more episode to go in Ad Astra. I'm going to miss doing this. I love playing Amicus. He's a great character. But it's good to see Alex again. I wasn't expecting that. That's why I had to uh, change my load screen at the beginning, because I saved there from when I played through on the Patreon version. Uh, I didn't want you guys to see that. <laughs> So I wonder what's going to happen with those two now. I don't know. Also, I have no clue what's going to go on in the next update. I'm kind of hoping we get a quick time skip of those eight years and we can 
pick things up on a dasher and kind of leave them there knowing what's going on but that's kind of up to Howley what if we can get a wedding CG from Haps that'd be nice but anyway yeah that is it I don't have too much more to say about this one it's kind of nice character driven stuff and I like hearing more from Virginia as well that was interesting yes the Emperor was doing his best for her but kind of reminds me of the uh, British royal family in some ways they're too wedded to certain things that you must be a certain way and they don't mind how they get there but I think that will change in the future with Amicus not that uh, as we saw the imperial family will be doing a whole lot more maybe the constitutional monarchy and Ad Astra who knows we're not going to get into that now but Yes, the uh, final episode is going to be done as a premiere because it's the final one. I just have a couple of little presentation things organised for before it. So if you had a problem with the previous premieres that you don't always get enough notice, I'm going to bake in a, a two minutes or so before the main VM starts. So don't worry about that. And you can skip over it then if you catch it later. You don't need to hear me doing my BBC Cymru Wales stuff. So until we meet again with Adastra, that's it for now. And if you follow my other videos, the smoke room is due out in about three days as I'm recording this. It's going to be William's update. And William is the other route along with Nikolai I will be doing from the smoke room. So watch out for that in a few days. I'll try and get that done as soon as possible. Uh, I promise you Tyson's route and password will be coming along right after that. It's just a lot of stuff going on at the moment that I had to take a brief break from what's going on in Password. It's all too close to home for a few things. But I will get back to that, I promise you, and we'll continue with that. So I hope you enjoyed this one, as I say. Until next time, bye for now.